Okay, so just to say again, um, this is a toolkit working group on what tools can help teachers and learners use open educational resources more and to use them more effectively. And one of the questions, the important questions in the midst of that, that is what it is that the Open Courseware Consortium should do, what our role can be in providing tools to users. Um, and so that's an open topic um, here and what, what you would find useful as users from the consortium in particular. Um, so we were starting to go around and introduce ourselves. And because the, in the chat window, it doesn't, when you log on, it doesn't show you what was said before you, you joined. Um, I'm going to just repeat what Celine said, which is that she's using Moodle to teach business English to first year students in France, right? Yes. Um, Jessica, why don't you tell us a little bit about the circumstances in which you do teaching and learning? OK, so just use chat. That's fine. Just expect that there will be a, delay, a bit of a delay because I have trouble typing and, um, and reading at the same time. So you're an instructional designer at, let's see, UMUC which I'm not remembering which. Hi, Dietmar. This is the toolkit session, and we're going around introducing everyone. Um, University of Maryland University College. I was trying to remember, think of, of whether the M was Mich Michigan. I'm in Indiana, so I was thinking Michigan, Minnesota. Um, University of Maryland, University College, and who, and what subject do you teach? Oh, pretty much. Okay, so you're you're working with the students. Okay. Um, what, what, oh, wait a minute, you said that you were, sorry, you were, you're an instructional designer, and I've missed that part, so I was, that's what I was, okay, so you're an instructional designer, you're thinking from the design standpoint, Selene is working from the teacher standpoint, Dietmar, what do you do? Dietmar, we're introducing ourselves and saying what our teaching and learning context is. Are you a student? Are you a teacher? Do you provide technical support to people? All of the above? Ah, you're a librarian. Great. Where? And a PhD candidate. Excellent. In what field? In, in library science or in, in Macedonia? Excellent. Marvelous in library science. Some of our best advocates have been, have been librarians, and so we're really pleased to have, have more people coming on board. And I would encourage you to see the copyright for, um, for librarians we've got in a number of different um, varieties on the, in the resources section. How about you, Peter? What's your teaching and learning context? Peter, can you tell us something about your where you teach or are a student or both or
You might try using the chat window if the microphone isn't working. Well, OK, why don't we go ahead and get started. So what we're talking about is um, we're really sort of brainstorming about what kinds of tools teachers and learners um, need and, and also how we might provide them so that um, they can use, one, find out about OER, but also use OER more effectively when they're, when they're doing their teaching. Um, and so I would love to hear from you, either in the chat window or using microphones. There are three of them, so the fact that I have the mic doesn't mean that I'm the only one who has the mic. Ah, okay. Deepmar has given us a, a URL. So if you want to click that on your end, you can see what he's doing. Oh, that's very nice. So Dietmar's done a, a kind of mind map, a mind map meets timeline of his different skills. That's a really nice presentation of it. Um, so you're doing a lot of work that, that is relevant to OER. Excellent. Wow, that's a lot of different languages. All right, so I, um, so I really want to hear from you about what kinds of tools you have found useful as you've been exploring OER, what you've found, um, you know, have been useful to people you're working with when they're thinking about teaching and learning with, um, with open educational resources. Ah, oh, there's Peter. Yeah, so a lot of people are using the MIT materials. Do you see that as a good, oh, there we go. Oh, okay, so here's a okay, so Jessica's talking about wanting to use the OER but feeling feeling blocked from using share alike licensing. So um, so it sounds like one of the things that we can do to help teachers and learners use the OER more effectively and to use them um, is to explain the way the licensing works. So Jessica, there really shouldn't be a barrier to people. You, I, I say this as someone who has put a share alike license on content. Um, I used to direct the OpenCourseWare project at the University of Notre Dame here. What that means is not that your students can't, you, you can't use the content in a situation where you're just delivering it to students who are enrolled in your course. It means that you can't, um, I mean, and the assumption is that, a, that any student who's enrolled in a course has to pay tuition. Um, but the idea is that they're paying the tuition for the teaching that they receive, not for the content. So the idea is not that you can't share it with people who happen to have paid for it, but that you can't do something like um, start 
a money mock. You can't sell the content. Um, so you couldn't print out my content if I had a share alike license on it and sell the book. You can charge for the printing of the book. You could, and, and in the teaching environment, you can charge tuition for having a teacher who interacts with you, but you can't say to other people, you can't have this unless um, you have it. So having the, having the content that you share with your students in an LMS, which I assume is, is part of what you're talking about, or creating a course packet for your students is not actually prohibited by the um, by a share alike license on open content. So maybe just making that more clear to people would actually help them use those materials more effectively. Now, one way of thinking about that, Jessica, is that if, um, if for example, as is, is common in, con in countries where there's not very much bandwidth, if I'm a teacher who lives in a city and has internet access and I print out a series of um, open educational resources and I take them out into the country to people who have no internet access, and they pay me for my printing costs, and I hand them copies of, of that material on paper, I'm not violating the license just because I'm not handing, I can only hand it to so many people. Um, it, the idea is simply that I can't say, um, make it available on the web behind a paywall, that people are explicitly paying for the content. It's, it's kind of an odd and difficult thing to, to work out, but it is, that's the accepted understanding in the field. So that's, a, that's actually an interesting concept because we often present licensing information more to the people who are producing open educational resources than to the people who are using them. And we need to increase, I and mean, there has been a fair amount of work done by um, Creative Commons, among other people, but not so much by groups like the Open Courseware Consortium to make it clear to people what they can actually do with these materials. What are other barriers that people encounter? Or other uses, I mean, the other question might be, um, what interesting uses of OER in teaching and learning have you witnessed? Not being, okay, so one of the barriers is not being able to understand how to use OER. Can you, um, do you think you could identify a little more closely where some of the problems are? What are people not understanding? And we've talked a little bit about licensing, but okay. Let's see. Oops.
So giving proper credit, right, so that people are concerned that somehow they're, um, they're stealing so much information, how to find adequate material without spending too much time, good. Right, so as we improve our search capacity, I'm going to just take a second, I need to click the, if you click the link, so this is, Dietmar has given us an example of an advanced algorithm class. Right, so, so without diving into, okay, so it should state on there that these materials, so these are materials from Princeton, if you're looking at, at this site, but it doesn't actually say whose materials those are. So perhaps, and I, I think that's, you know, one question is, um, you know, without diving back in there, um, into the course, do, I assume that they don't then say on individual pages that those are materials from Princeton because there are some question, you know, there's some question as to whether you put that on the syllabus. Oh, just a second, I'm having trouble getting into my typing window again. It seems to want to kick me out periodically. There we go. So giving proper credit. So maybe if we provided a diagram or examples for um, of how to put a notice right. Um, Right, well, and that's also complicated if what you're doing is not, I mean, if you're printing something or putting it on the, on the web, then you would cite it in one way, but if you're using the materials in the class, and then you're going to have another, a different kind of situation where what you need to do is, you know, if I'm just going to show a video to my students, then what I may need to do is a, is a slightly different thing. I may have a little speech that I need to give. This is the material that I've taken from this site. Um, so there are going to be different ways of showing uh, credit depending on the circumstances in which you're using the OER. Oh, you weren't able to hear me at all. I don't know. Sorry, Peter. I mean, some might argue that you didn't miss much. <laughs> um, right, and we make these assumptions that, oh, well, you know, these are academics and so they know how to do citation, but it's a different kind of, of environment because we're not used to doing citation when we're, when we're teaching. Um, the question of how to find adequate material without find, spending too much time is, is an important one and we've actually had another sit, set of discussions about that, about how to use different tools because the difficulty is there are different tools out there for finding material but they are um, in different languages, they are using different um, protocols for how to describe the content, um, and because it's a moving target, um, that's been very difficult. There are some very promising projects, one at the University of Nottingham and the other one at um, uh, Politecnica de Madrid, it's called Serendipity. I forget what the Nottingham project is. Um, and yes, knowing how to ask, um, so there are search tools.
ask a librarian. I'll, I'll confess that when I got started in the open educational movement, I, um, I learned everything I needed to know about copyright from one of our reference librarians who gave me a quick tutorial and then I, I went from there. Yes, there are some meta search um, tools there. So serendipity, I'm going to actually concentrate serendipity, there we go. Um, oh, what is, I think the Nottingham one is called X, oops. Wait a minute, somehow my typing got stymied here. Expert, okay. I knew it was X something. I couldn't remember if it, it probably a Freudian slip that I said it was exert instead of expert. Um, there's the OCW search, which is on the OpenCourseWare website. Open Courseware Consortium website. So there are a number of different projects that are trying to approach the issues of search from from different angles. Let me ask you, what kinds of things do you want to know or do the people you work with want to know when they're doing searching? Because one of the things that we're always trying to keep track of is how to ask get a search engine that asks the questions that the users are asking. So clearly subject material is, is a an issue. But what other what other fields would you want to see in the search? I'm going to turn the microphone off. I have to cough just a moment. intro versus advanced. Sorry about that. I swallowed my coffee. To, I, or sorry, I inhaled my coffee. Uh, okay, I will type that into the notes as soon as I can get my cursor to behave. Come on. Oh, there it is. All right, so static versus interactive. Uh, what it, there was another one that was up there. Level. Right, and that level of instruction is a little bit difficult in, to hit because whether it's a beginning class for someone in a community college versus a beginning class at MIT can be a very, very different thing. So we need a fairly nuanced way of describing um, the level of instruction. Right, is this for a one-on-one class high school students? Dietmar, you want to explain a little more about what you mean by interactive? I think it was, okay, the language, good. The language of instruction. And indeed, with the language of instruction, we may want to know something about the culture of instruction. So for example, um, French Canadian might be very different from Parisian. Um, not simply in small areas of, of vocabulary and pronunciation if it's an audio um, issue, but there are going to be different cultural assumptions built into the content that may be confusing for people. And, and issues about the culture of instruction, um, how people go about teaching in the different cultures. So maybe one of the questions might be, I'm going to put down as another level, is 
um, how to localize. content for your teaching con teaching and learning context. Um, and where by localizing we mean anything from translation to um, changing the cultural assumptions to using different examples that are going to make sense to your students. You know, if you have inner city students, then farm examples are not going to make sense for them necessarily. Are there other things that you look for in your in search or that you're, the people you're working with are looking for? Looks like we're having some, I'm seeing all sorts of little red buttons showing up. It sounds like we're having some audio delay. Are people having trouble Peter. hearing? I am just trying the microphone now. Um, I can hear you OK. But I see other indicators going up. I was just going to add that um, besides the question mm -hmm. of whether the content is static or interactive, um, we get a lot of questions about uh, media type. Uh, you know, is, is there video? Is there uh, audio? Um, mm -hmm. Documents. Mm -hmm. Good. And what do you find with um, with media type? Because, and I ask that. Well, just what do you find that people are looking for, and do you find that what they're looking for matches what you think they need? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of demand for video. Uh, mm -hmm. I think um, I'm sorry, I missed the introduction part of this. I'm actually from MIT OpenCourseWare. Um, uh, so we have a lot of demand for video lectures uh, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, often courses that we publish uh, without video will get questions about that. Um, Beyond mm -hmm. video, there's you know, everything kind of falls off from there. But there's interest in um, uh, problem sets, uh, exams, uh, lecture notes. That's another mm -hmm. big one. Even if there is video, there's still demand for lecture notes as well. Well, that's and, and I ask because there's a lot of debate. And this might go into the using OER effectively question. The, there's a lot of debate as to whether video lectures simply reinforce a teaching model of the expert in front of the room, um, you know, the talking head, where the students are simply um, absorbing the knowledge but not doing anything with it, that it's not interactive in various ways. And so the question of whether, whether and how teachers are using video lectures is, is an interesting one. I mean, it, and there yeah. are, of course, options like the flipped classroom that make use of that. You um, actually point out a, a, a good distinction that um, I was failing to make, which is between what students or self-learners are looking for and what uh, teachers are looking for. Um, and I think teachers are looking for a video, but it's a different type of video. It's right. less interest in lecture, more interest in demonstrations or um, uh, mm -hmm. less talking head video. Um, but that's something I should uh, take a look at because we actually have survey right. data about differentiating between what um, our different types of users are looking for. Oh, that that would be very useful to share. If if you is that okay? Mm 
Do you, well, I'm not sure what the that is because I didn't see when your link showed up. Can you tell us what the that, you say here's an example of that, but I don't know what we were talking about at that particular moment. I'm following the link right now, which is in, is that, is that Macedonian or is that in Macedonian Greek or is that Russian? It's about video used in OER. Okay. I'm going to plug that into Google Translate, my best friend. And so it's from the Republic of Macedonia. Oops, it did not. Oops, I accidentally translated into French, which is not going to do me a lot of good. There we go. So this is a presentation about comorbidity of Down syndrome. So the professor is using a YouTube video to, uh, to supplement the lectures. Okay, that makes sense. Um, right, so the, so the teachers are, are often wanting or, or lecturers or, I mean, so formal and informal teachers um, want to use the content as a way to, to do, give a demonstration or to supplement, sometimes just to make sure that the audience is awake. Um, uh, then, so Jessica's saying, we're also looking for videos that are no longer than a few minutes long and supplement other contents, right? So. Um, I'm going to put short. Of course, what counts as short depends on how much time you have in your in your t instructional period, right? If you're if you're doing a workshop that lasts all day, then then you short might be 15 minutes. But if you're running an hour long class, then you may want five. Um, so maybe one of the questions would be also um, not just the media type, but The gra I'm going to say granularity, um, which for those who don't work in in tech is is what kind of pieces can it be broken into, right? Can it be done in big pieces and little pieces? Um, do you have to be an expert? So if you have a long video and you're not um, and you're a little bit alarmed by the prospect of editing video, which often is a contact is a factor of how old you are. I find that my children are much more comfortable editing video than I am. Um, then, you know, the need to break the video down into the, the few minutes that you need could could be a problem um, for some people. Uh, you know, somebody my age is more likely to be able to sort of say, okay, well, I'll just set it up where I want and press start and stop. Um, somebody older might find that a little frustrating. My mother certainly would, would have a hard time doing that, but then she was having trouble programming a v VCR when those came out. Um, so depending on how much um, comfort the user has with technology, then the question of how the pieces is, are broken up is going to be important. You know what? I'm looking at the clock and saying that we're we're down to our last few minutes. What other Questions and concerns do you have that that you would want a tool to address, or do you what kinds of questions and concerns do you find people bringing to you about teaching and learning with OER? Ah, 
Okay, so case studies on how, so actually hearing, okay, now I'm going to type that down as soon as I can get this to cooperate again. All right, so we would want case studies Right. How is someone I can recognize as someone like me using these materials? What else? Mm -hmm. So Mina is saying that in, in one of the Korean universities they're using clips from MIT's physics course because those are classes that are being conducted in English in Korea. Ah, and Peter has provided us with a URL to some educator case studies from MIT. So Mina, when you say the cases would be helpful in designing my course, so just to be able to think about here's here's an application. Okay. Dietmar, were you about to say something? I saw that the chat room signal went on for you. Mm -hmm. Right, so the people are going to use it more, far more than they're reusing it. That's, that's a, um, ah. So are you thinking, Celine, that it would be great to have ways of actually sending news back to the clock, not just use the resource, but to be able to say, this is how I use the resource so that you and the author can, in some sense, have a conversation about. Um, about how, you, how it worked in your classroom or how you changed it. Dietmar, did you mean that people um, reuse the material straightforwardly more often than they remix? Is that your idea? Yes, OK. I just want to make sure I'm recording you properly. Aha, OK. So, so Celine's comment was about not just Okay, I'm going to, come on. The platform is not wanting to collaborate with me. That's what it's not doing. Okay. Okay, there we go. Not only use the materials, but work with the author to improve them.
Right. So the personal use of. Um, mm hmm Right. So that that notion of of starting a collaboration from looking on the web and finding resources and saying, hey, this person's interested in the same subjects is is one of the more useful ways of doing it. And then you know, having a conversation either on or offline. Excellent. Well, we are running out of time. I want to thank you for your participation today. I will be, I'm going to give you my email address. Let's see, who just put that, uh, let me put my email address and then I'll, I can see that there's a comment appearing as I'm typing, but I will, that's my email there. And this is an ongoing project, so I will, if you email me and would like to have a copy of these notes, I'd be happy to share them with you. Um, and if you would like to be involved in that project on an ongoing basis, um, I would be delighted to hear from you about that. And thank you for all the, the things that you've shared, both Dietmar and Peter. Those are very valuable. I'm going to see if I can copy out. I guess I can. I'm going to try to copy out what's in the chat window so that I can get those URLs and I will include them at the bottom of the page. Yes, okay. I, it has allowed me to um, cut and paste the chat window, so I will include. I will paste the. I'll sort out the URLs and include those at the bottom of these notes. Thank you so much for joining us, Jessica. Are you giving us your URL? Your um, sorry, your email as well. Thanks. Excellent. Have a good day.